Hi, I'm Sarah Aguilar, co-founder of Live Energy, and today I have the pleasure of speaking to Chris Canobe at the Ancestral Health Symposium in San Diego. Chris is an expert in healthy and unhealthy fats. He's an MD and an ophthalmologist. The reason this subject is so important is because, as you know, we talk a lot about eating a high fat diet, but unhealthy fats pervasive in processed foods, particularly in Western society, and strongly correlated with a lot of chronic diseases, and they are everywhere, and nobody's explaining to you why these vegetables are dangerous, what makes an unhealthy fat unhealthy, and how you can avoid them by looking at labels too. But Chris is going to explain what happens in the body, the difference between healthy and unhealthy fats, the dangers that we face, and what we can eliminate to be healthier. So thank you so much for taking the time out to be here and for your fantastic presentation. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, my pleasure. I want to know what you think is the biggest threat to our health today with regards to nutrition. Right, so absolutely the big picture is that it is the man-made, processed, nutrient-deficient, toxic foods that are the problem. And those really are four things. They're sugars, added sugars that is, the refined white wheat flour. They are the polyunsaturated vegetable oils and the trans fats. And if you put those four foods together, which are all new to the world's diet, essentially in about the last 150 years, those are processed foods. No matter what they are, whether it's a cookie, a pizza, or a Pop-Tart, or whatever it is it's that's processed, it's made out of those four foods. And when you make a significant amount of your diet out of those foods then what happens is is you get nutrient deficiencies and you get toxicities and both of those combined lead to metabolic disaster so that's it in a nutshell really that's the big picture and with these processed oils or unhealthy fats what makes them unhealthy? Perfect question. So, one of my colleagues, Kate Shanahan, uh, MD, uh, who has researched this for 20 some years and she's worked a lot with the lipid chemists, meaning the oil chemists, what she says is that nature doesn't make bad fats, factories do. And when I heard her say that a few years ago, it made so much sense to me because if you take the oil that comes out of um, a soybean or a sunflower seed, for example, and you just crush those and you collect that oil and you eat it, it's perfectly fine. But when these oils are made in factories, they go through um, all kinds of heating processes they're chemically treated and the end result is, is you have these severely damaged oils. They're oxidized and they're associated with toxic aldehydes and then when we consume them they oxidize further in our bodies and the toxic aldehydes also cause severely damaging effects. And so, but to me the way to avoid that, that is, believe it or not, is to get back to the animal fats. So the animal fats are what we consumed through all of history until shortly after the American Civil War, 1865, is the first time that we have ever had any vegetable oils. It started with cottonseed oil in about 1866 or so. And these oils began to 
over the next 150 years, or really until today, these vegetable oils began to replace and supplant the animal fats, lard, butter, and beef tallow, and then the animal fats that come directly from eating any kind of animal, whether it's beef, fowl, fish, pork, whatever. So when we replaced the healthy animal fats with vegetable oils, we started getting sick. And the more we consumed, the sicker we got. We started developing obesity, we got heart disease, hypertension, type two diabetes, stroke, cancers, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, age-related macular degeneration, the, all the autoimmune diseases, all of these are uh, correlated strongly to the consumption of not only just the westernized processed foods, but they show a very strong correlation to these vegetable oils, these, uh, these man-made processed vegetable oils. They're extraordinarily dangerous. Yeah, so we get that the vegetable seed itself is not toxic. It's the, pro the heat processing of these seeds that makes them dangerous for consumption because essentially they are fine to eat. It's fine to eat sunflower seed, but sunflower oil that's been heat processed is not. The rule that I follow at home is if it's solid at room temperature, you can cook with it and that's safe. And if it's liquid, not that I'd have vegetable oils at home, but like olive oil, for example, avocado oil, you would just use it for salad dressing. And that, and that automatically is your, your animal fats. So beef tallow, butter, lard, ghee, um, particularly quinoa, and then coconut oil being solid at room temperature with a high smoking point is safe to eat. And that, if you use that formula, solid at room temperature, then it's, then it's generally very safe, ideally grass-fed where possible. But what would be interesting to know is, so these unhealthy fats related to all of these diseases and oxidation, what does that actually look like in the body? So what makes them toxic when you consume them? Like what's going on with the, because I understand that the fat structure, the molecules change structure, and that oxidizes when you consume them. How would you explain that to someone without your slides, without your right. brilliant slides? Right. Exactly what it is. You take in that degraded fat, what happens in the body, and especially when you talk about the mitochondrial function, and that, that would be key to go into, if you can. Sure. So when we consume fats, the omega-6 fats, for example, coming from these uh, edible oils, it would be great if we could just metabolize those and burn those for fuel in what we'd call beta oxidation. Um, but there is another pathway that where these oils are actually accumulating in our body and they were meant to because we were designed to get tiny amounts of these oil, these fats, the omega-6 fats. We were designed probably to get these from traditionally raised uh, animals and the consumption probably would have been um, two, maybe 3% of our, of our uh, consumption. But instead, for example, in Western society, consumption is now ranging from eight to 10% linoleic acid omega-6. And so then what happens is, is that instead of being able to just burn those for fuel, as I said, we accumulate, the, accumulate them in our tissues, in our fat, in our cell membranes, and they live there for years because the half-life of these oils in our cell membranes is 600 to 680 days. Well, the problem with the polyunsaturated fats, which are both omega-6 and omega-3, is that they can oxidize easily because they have double bonds. Whereas the monounsaturated fats and saturated fats, they won't hardly oxidize, oxidize at all. So that's why good true olive oil, which is mostly monounsaturated fat, is healthy if it's good true olive oil. And saturated fats coming from grass-fed animals, very, very healthy. So back to the accumulation of these omega-6 
fats in our cell membranes is that they begin to oxidize. And why do they oxidize? Because we, in our metabolism, create uh, reactive oxygen species like hydroxyl radicals and superoxides and these are created by the trillions in our bodies all the time and and what happens is is it begins the process of oxidizing one of those fats okay starts with one molecule which takes one millisecond well the the next molecule of unsaturated fat sitting next to it also gets oxidized and this becomes a vicious circle and so as I've mentioned, you know, a thousand of these molecules can be oxidized every second. Well, when they're oxidized, they're damaged. And that damage leads to, in a, in a roundabout way, is, is you end up with damage to incredibly important molecules like cardiolipin, for example, that is a phospholipid in our mitochondria. Our mitochondria are what make energy. And when that cardiolipin is damaged, it fails, and we end up with energy production failure is one of the mechanisms that is how these fats are so damaging to us is that they create mitochondrial dysfunction, and we know that mitochondrial dysfunction is uh, one of the unifying characteristics of all these diseases of civilization, from heart disease to um, uh, autoimmune diseases, to type 2 diabetes, to obesity, and the list just goes on and on. So what we don't want to have is, we don't want to be filling up our cellular membranes with omega-6 fats because they can just start oxidizing like a house of fire. And they just, it's just like, you know, you're just burning through all those fats and you're just getting damage that is uh, ubiquitous in your body. It's damaging, ultimately you get damage to DNA in your nucleus and in your mitochondria, the, 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 the chromosomal structures. You get damage to lipids, damage to proteins. And what is the end result of that is, is the cell malfunctions becomes dysfunctional. And when cells get sick, we get sick. And there's, there's just a myriad of things that go wrong. I mean, this is you know, what cell biology is all about and something that biologists study for years and years trying to understand the pathophysiology of what's going wrong in the cell. And honestly, most of it begins with our diet. It almost all begins and ends with a diet, and a diet particularly that has high omega-6. And then if you add nutrient deficiencies, in other words, make it a westernized diet, plenty of omega-6 fat, nutrient deficiencies because you've consumed other nutrient deficient foods, and now you don't have the vitamins, the minerals, the phytonutrients, everything that helps protect your cells from oxidative damage now you're at risk. And this is how uh, a westernized diet leads to all of these seemingly you know, dis disparate diseases, but they're not. They're all under the umbrella of a bad diet. How so man-made diseases entirely. Yeah, absolutely, right. My question regarding, so the mitochondria, like the powerhouse cells of the body, how would you, they're, they're essentially like our batteries, so that they ca can't use the energy that we're giving it because the energy's been oxidized. Would that be a simplified way of explaining it? How, yes, would, you, I think how would you describe or explain the mitochondria? So when you have uh, too much omega-6 fat, in the diet, one of the things that happens is, is that this molecule called cardiolipin that is a phospholipid that is part of our, this gets complicated, but it's part of our electron transport chain, which is where around 99% of our energy is created, that cardiolipin becomes peroxidized, which means oxidized, and it's damaged. And when it's damaged, it can no longer um, essentially hold uh, an, electro, uh, an electronic charge 
if you will, electrochemical charge is really what it would be, meaning it can't support hydrogen protons in a gradient, which is what is required to produce ATP. And this gets <laughs> deeply complicated <laughs> very fast. And I hate to throw out these concepts um, like this without, when people start seeing images and they can get this in their head, it's m so much simpler, but, um, but you know, the, um, the, the simplified version really is that uh, lots of omega-6 fats, in other words, too much seed oil coming from processed foods is severely damaging to our mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell and it can shut down cell production, I mean, energy production. And that can lead to causing your cells to want to just store the fat because they can't burn it properly. So they want to store it and then they become dependent on glycolysis, which means more dependent on burning carbs for fuel. And so now what happens is, is your body wants to just start putting away fat, you're gaining weight, but guess what? Your energy production, your energy is down. And so now you feel like a sloth and you want to eat more because you're fatigued. Why are you fatigued? Because your mitochondria are failing because the oils damage them. I mean, you, like you said, our mitochondria are like our batteries. I mean, if you don't have energy, what happens to us? I mean, if you take any system, if, if I have zero energy and I can't get out of bed, my house falls apart, right? If I can't, there's, there's always a trend towards entropy. Everything wants to become disorganized until you put energy in it. And it's the same at the cellular level. If the cell can't make energy properly, then the cell literally begins to fall apart at the seams. And that leads us down path, pathways towards uh, what's called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, or necrosis, which is necrotic or toxic cell death. And then, the, and then what comes out of that is, is you get, when you have energy failure, you get, like I said, mitochondrial and DNA uh, mutations. That's what happens when the cell can't make energy, and out of that we get cancers. So we're getting, you know, we're gaining weight, we're getting cancers, we get uh, the reactive oxygen species that come out of this, that when the electron transport ch chain is failing, they create insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is a part of almost every disease there is, but that leads down the path of creating type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and, um, you know, energy failure leads to heart failure. The list just goes on and on. You can see that, you know, to me, the way I look at it is, is you have this at the base. I always think of it, I saw this picture once of the mushroom cloud and at the base you have this processed food, right? And then in the mushroom cloud, you have all of these diseases of civilization, heart disease, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, macular degeneration, and you start thinking, surely these are not all related, but they are. They're all related to the processed food diet. So that, that processed food diet sits at the epicenter and it leads to catastrophic disease. Yeah, because those diseases just didn't exist before on the same level. Right. Absolutely. So I think what we're getting at is the mitochondria is your energy powerhouse of the body. And when you feel high energy and good, essentially your mitochondria are functioning really, really well. And when you're not feeling good and going, degenerating towards sickness or even quite tired, there's something going on with the mitochondria not being able to access the energy that you're consuming. And if you are eating degraded fats, processed foods, inflammatory foods, you can't utilize that energy so you end up storing fat getting fat getting a ton of autoimmune diseases or chronic diseases 
there's a lot of energy going in, but your mitochondria isn't using it. So to really achieve high energy, you need to take the toxins out and feed yourself the energy that we were designed to eat, which is not what's been introduced in the past 150 years. Exactly. Essentially. Yeah. Exactly. It's, um, it's, very, it's very difficult though, because if you go into a supermarket, and you, even in health food shops, and you want to avoid vegetable oils, there's just, they're everywhere, they're pervasive in everything. It's, you've got to read, so how would you go about kind of, if you're going to a supermarket or shop, grocery shopping, how do you know, that? what do you need to look out for that shouldn't be on the label when you're choosing foods? Right, well, uh, first of all, I, I think that if you, start very simply when you are at the periphery of the grocery store you're mostly safe right <laughs> with you know with yeah. meats um, you know eggs dairy fruits and vegetables there you're safe and as one as I've heard it said many times once you get into the aisles is is a lot more where the danger zones are and now that's a very big picture and it's a you know as everything that's big picture there's a lot of nuance here that, and, and a lot of details that we're overlooking if that's all we do. Because, for example, even some of the, you know, the meats that are not traditionally raised, in other words, if they're not raised on grass and they're consuming, uh, you know, GMO, corn and soy, those kinds of things, well, their fatty acid profiles are also not as good. So this is another reason to, if you can afford it is, try to get the pastured um, animal products. But, and then as far as the oils, so the polyunsaturated oils are these. They are soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. In the United States, and I believe it's this way in the United Kingdom, those oils right there represent around 97% of the oils in our food supply. Okay. So the olive oil, so the healthy ones, which are the, the tropical oils, coconut, palm, and palm kernel, those are fine. And then olive oil would be fine as long as it's true. Now, in when I say true, I mean authentic, because in the United States, at they least. cut them, don't they, sometimes? Yeah, 80% of the so-called olive oil in the United States is adulterated with dirt cheap vegetable oils. And I, I found recently data on the cost of those oils. So the, the, when processed food manufacturers buy uh, these edible oils to add to their processed foods, they're buying them for a, a dollar, one US dollar for a kilogram, for a thousand grams. A thousand grams of oil is 9,000 calories worth for one dollar. So how much food can they make? All, all processed food is made primarily out of sugar, refined white flour, and these vegetable oils. So it takes them pennies to create a few hundred calories worth of food actually and that's how they're doing it so as far as getting back to the oil so if you're if, if the food has coconut oil palm oil palm kernel um, oils in, in in the food i think you're pretty safe those are all pretty safe olive oil i wouldn't trust it unless you can verify the authenticity i mean we're a bit safer in europe compared to here yeah. You heard that it is? Yeah. I yeah, believe I it. I think it's worse in the States. I believe it. But I also heard that um, the Italians um, have raised a big stink because there's a, there's a lot of people that are producing um, adulterated oils coming out of Italy. And the Italians don't like this at all because they know, that, I mean, they have a reputation for having the best oils in the world and have had for a long time, so they certainly don't like this. So we have to be careful, and I tell people that um, you, the best thing to do is, is to try to validate that, that, the, that if it's olive oil, that you know that it's authentic. You could visit 
uh, the, the company or whatever you have to do to try to be certain that it's authentic. I think with taste as well, if you get if you've got an acquired taste, then you can tell the difference. Yeah. Um, but that, that takes a bit longer. You can't go around tasting everything. Right. But but that certainly is something that we like. We can tell if it's if it's olive oil or or not or something right. else. Um, but we're lucky at home with with the selection that we have. Right. But I think um, you talked about how having French fries is a lot more dangerous than smoking a cigarette. Can you tell, tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do believe that, that French fries is far worse than smoking actually probably quite a lot of cigarettes. And the reason is, first of all, because of the fact that when we consume these oils, they don't just um, leave our body that day. They become us. When we consume carbs, for example, no matter what they are, they don't actually become us. We can store carbs as glycogen in our liver and in our muscles, and you can't store very much. If you, if you don't consume carbs, you know, you're gonna burn through your carbs in a couple of days, for example. But the fats, we, have an, uh, we can store massive amounts of fats, and that's what we do with these let's just call them bad fats, these edible oils, is they are stored in our adipose tissue and they're stored in our cellular membranes everywhere. And what happens is, is really three things. One, they peroxidize, meaning they undergo oxidation. They're damaging to everything like I mentioned. They're damaging to cell membranes, they're damaging to DNA, they're damaging to your own, uh, your other lipids and your proteins. The list is endless. It's like a house of fire, okay? Second, they're gonna create an inflammation pathway. They're going to lead us down the path towards creating uh, inflammatory mediators, um, like leukotrienes and eicosanoids, for example, all right? Third, the vegetable oils are going to come with dangerous aldehydes. And the aldehydes come out of primarily from heated oils. And these aldehydes are chemicals like 4-hydroxynonanol, 4-HNE, malondialdehyde, um, carboxyethylpyrrole, and acrolein. And one of the examples I gave is in this talk is that acrolein, for example, is uh, averages around 50 some micrograms in an average cigarette. But in a large McDonald's french fries, for example, um, you're getting 1,000 to 1,500 micrograms of acrolein, this toxin which creates cancer. You're getting that much in the french fries. So that means that eating a large French, French fries is the equivalent of consuming 17 to 26 average cigarettes in terms of acrolein consumption or exposure, or up to 83 cigarettes that are low in acrolein. That's insane. It's, insane. it's absolutely so insane. Basically having French fries that have been fried in degraded fats is, is worse than or equal to smoking 83 cigarettes. Right. That, yeah. And so here's oh. the here's the other issue with that is, to the best of my knowledge, to understand it, if you smoke a pack of cigarettes today, I'm not a fan of smoking. I hate smoking. Okay. I don't. It's terrible. We're not promoting smoking. Right. <laughs> We're just saying that's how bad veg vegetable oils are for you. In exactly. Terms of how dangerous they are and damaging. Right. Yeah. So if you po smoke a pack of cigarettes today, to the best of my ability to understand it, you are going to uh, create a pro-oxidative effect. That's what this is all about. Oxidation is a big deal because that's how everything, that's how our cells are damaged ultimately. So, but if you smoke, let's go back to this, a pack of cigarettes today, you're going to have an increased pro-oxidative effect to the best of my ability to understand it, which will last a few months. Eat McDonald's, well, okay, eat French fries. I could just say eat 
potato chips, french fries, whatever, something that's made in heated oils out of your body. But we do know the half-life, 600 to 680 days. That's approaching two years, <laughs> that's a right? Long time. Yeah. And so that's why I say, you know, when you give your little child these french fries, you're poisoning him for a long time. I know he wants them. He's gonna love them. But the, the best thing you can do for him is take those away. We need to take them, take those kind of foods out of our diets. I wouldn't consume, I would just go hungry, you know. I would never eat those. Yeah, with the option of a damaging, dangerous food versus the benefits of autophagy from fasting. Right. <laughs> you know, you know which one you're gonna go for. And it's not saying that you can't treat yourself occasionally, because you can still have fried foods in fats that are healthy that don't degrade in heat. So coconut oil or butter or tallow. If you did your fried chips in those, that's not a problem unless you're following a low carb diet. But essentially there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just changing some of the materials because ultimately if you want to optimize your energy and health and sugar at least you can burn off but degraded fats will degrade you oxidize your insides and, and cause malfunction within mitochondria i.e you're not going to feel the energy that you need to succeed in everything that you do you just won't be able to because you're damaging yourself and the effects of that last two years from one from one one packet of French fries, which is worse than smoking a cigarette, and uh, we know the dangers of that. But we need we need governments to start talking about this because this is so serious. It's yeah. I, I don't know what what you think. I mean, it's the reason we have vegetables and processed foods is because it's cheap, it's efficient, economic. They have a long shelf life and they're calorically dense processed foods, but they've got no nutritional value. What do you think we would need to shift so that the food system was more based on healthy foods in terms of the government promoting fewer processed foods in our diet? Or is that, that is a, this is like too big a question? No, that <laughs> is a know. great question. <laughs> and of course, you know, that becomes the policy question, which in my opinion, I don't believe our governments are going to act on this and the reason that I don't is because these dangerous foods that have been grandfathered in, we introduced the good old United States introduced cottonseed oil to the world in the late 1860s and the first place we sent it was to the UK and then to the rest of Europe. and. Since these oils have been in our food supply for roughly 145 years or so, whatever the, the number is from 1865, um, they are assumed to be safe by our governments until proven otherwise. And although I think there's a whole lot of research to suggest otherwise, there is some very conflicted research that tries to support the, the, the consumption of these dangerous fats. And that is another entire issue, but that has to do with funding. Mm. Yeah, and I think absolutely. that's why I say there's major conflicts. Uh, um, and that is a, that's a, that's a dangerous topic. Very controversial. Very to controversial. Yeah. So yeah. I think the bottom line though to me is is that I believe that you know big food manufacturers there's one thing that makes them change and it's to make money. And so with the people decide for example they're not going to buy the foods with those oils. My understanding is is that a 10 to 20% change in a consumption will make these companies re-evaluate their position on the, uh, the, the composition of their foods. And that's enough to make change. So when people go out and they decide they're gonna buy potato chips that are cooked in healthy uh, coconut oil, for example, or avocado oil, 
they've made a healthy choice. Yes, it costs more right now, but if a lot more people start doing it, it would drive the price down. And it's also going to make the manufacturers take a look at the fact that they're putting soybean and canola, cottonseed, and these other dangerous, unhealthy, um, high polyunsaturated fat oils in their foods. But if they can't sell them, exactly, they're yeah. going to change their position. So you've got to vote with your wallet. You do. You have to, to vote with your wallet. Worlds. Yeah. If you could give people one piece of advice, um, a swap or a change they would make in their diet, what would it be? The only way that I know of to fix the whole diet, very simply, is make all of your own food. That's the only <laughs> way I know. We, and we, re, we, we have resorted to um, being so cautious about eating out that the, almost the only things that I feel really safe with is sushi and steak. Um, otherwise, I'm not saying I won't eat anything else other than those, but those are the things that I feel really safe about and we're just extremely cautious about eating out. One thing you can do in restaurants that works pretty well is, is, is you ask what they're gonna cook your food in and if you wanna really get their attention, you wanna really wanna make sure that you're not getting these high PUFA oils, you tell your waiter or waitress that you have an allergy to vegetable oils. I can't have vegetable oils. I could, um, I could go into anaphylactic shock. I'm sure it's a little fib, but your life's at stake. They're not the ones eating the, the poisoned food with these oils, you are, right? And so uh, you can tell them that you have an allergy to those oils and you need your food cooked in real butter or you can't have it. And if that's impossible, because a lot of these restaurants, they don't have butter or a healthy oil like coconut oil or palm oil if, they, if it needs to be cooked in butter. And so if that's the case, then choose something that doesn't need an oil. Like, I don't know, grilled chicken breast, for example, oh, you know? Idea. Or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you can get, you can also get steamed vegetables, things like that. And then, you know, sometimes they have butter in packets on the table and you can slather butter on it. So, I mean, I mean, and sometimes they'll bring you melted, some places will just bring you melted butter and you can just, because we need fat. We need, oh, we, we need plenty yeah, of fat. Absolutely, yeah. Fat that's is good. good I mean, yeah, but it's got to be the right kind. Yeah, that's a really good hack, though. So just say you're allergic to vegetable oils. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to use that one because we are, when we go out, we always say, can we have it cooked in ghee or butter? And that in England, that's not a problem normally. It's fine, right. but I can imagine over here, you ask for butter and you might get margarine. Right. Which is really worrying. Um, right. Yeah, that was just fantastic. Thank you so much for, oh, my for sharing all of that knowledge. I wish we could go on for longer, but I know you have to rush okay. off. But um, I think that's just so much information there. But key thing is, if you really care about your health, the one most important thing is eliminating vegetable oils because your DNA is made up of them. If you eat degraded fats, you're degrading your body and your DNA and destroying your mitochondria which is so much worse than having sugar, which you can just burn off. I mean, sugar is obviously not, processed sugar is not ideal, but vegetable oils, you become, you literally, you are what you eat when you eat that kind of degraded fat. So the key to being healthy, stay away from them, go for the healthy fats. And thank you so much, so much for My your pleasure, time today. Sarah. And how can people follow you and keep up to date with your work? Yes, so our website is CureAMD, so it's C-U-R-E-A-M-D dot org. That, uh, the organization is CureAMD Foundation. We're all about preventing vision loss from age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65 worldwide. And this is where um, uh, my work took me and so but I go from highly focused to really broad but they all run together mm -hmm. and the same you know diet that is 
good for macular degeneration, prevents all this other disease, so they all go together. To find out more, head there. Um, thank you so much. That was, that thank, was you, great. thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you.